Hello, I'm Paul Joachim. I'm Chief of the Biostatistics and Clinical Epidemiology, Epidemiology Service at the NIH Clinical Center, and this is part three of hypothesis testing. And in this part, we're going to talk about something really exciting that is happening, you know, really right now, uh, spring 2019 and you'll see what I'm talking about. It's about the ASA and the reporting of p-values. And the ASA stands for the American Statistical Association. But let me start with the reporting of the p-value, and let me start with how not to report p-values. This is the old way, and we really need to change this practice. We, the scientific community. Uh, and what I'm talking about is when you, you, know, you publish your manuscript, and you put a table and you have stars and then a footnote and it says p-value less than 0.05. Uh, we, we need to stop doing that. Um, the, the, the irony of this is that I'm a co-author of this paper. Uh, this was back in 2009. And I, I basically, I remember even back then, I, I didn't like that. I didn't like the star p-value less than 0.05. And I told the lead author about it that, you know, can't we put the actual value of the p-values? And basically the answer was, well, this is the format of the journal. This is the way the journal wants it. And so that's why we, we had to do it this way. But it's changing. This is going to change. Uh, this is, of course, 10 years ago, so it, it is changing. Uh, but just want to make sure that this is not the way to do it. Uh, instead, how to report it is you just put the value of the p-value, like in this table. They actually, the, the authors give the, the value of the p-value. And you say, okay, fine. Well, it is important because look at those two p-values that are highlighted. One is 0.062 and one is 0.042. Same table, two p-values. <clears throat> now, if we were to put stars, you know, the first one would not get a star because it is greater than 0.05, and the bottom one would get a star because it's less than 0.05. Well, let me make things very, very clear. 0.062 is not very different from 0.042. It's really not different. Uh, so to have one with a star and one without a star gives the impression to the reader that, oh yeah, the one is statistically significant and the other one is not, when in fact the two are pretty much the same. So again, uh, put the value of the p-value and we're gonna talk, believe me, we're gonna talk more about this in this segment. So that's what I want to talk about, the American Statistical Association. And just give you a background about the American Statistical Association. According to its website, it was founded in Boston in 1839. So it's 180 years old. It is the world's largest community of statisticians. It is the second oldest continuously operating professional association in the country and it has members from all over the world. So it's not just uh, American statisticians. So it, the, the point here is that it is a very respectable and it's been around for a while. Uh, it's a very respectable association. And so what, what, what about the American Statistical Association? Well, in March 2016, the ASA issued a statement on p-values and statistical significance. And it says, this is the first time the ASA has spoken so publicly about a fundamental part of statistical theory and practice. The first time, and it's a 180 years old association. Uh, so there, it was a big deal. It was a big deal back in 2016. And I'm gonna talk about what, what this is about. But I'm just giving you sort of a, first the history and then, and then we're gonna go into more detail. Then in October 2017, there was an ASA symposium on, on, symposium on statistical inference. And the title was Scientific Method for the 21st Century, a World Beyond P Less Than 0.05. This was a two-day conference talking only about p-values. I attended that conference because it was here in Bethesda. And, and so it was really a very good conference and uh, very eye-opening uh, information. 
And then in March 2019, so we're just talking about, what, two months ago, um, well, three months ago, there was a special issue of the American Statistician. And the title of that special issue was Statistical Inference in the 21st Century, A World Beyond P Less Than 0.05. Uh, this special issue had a, it started with a 19-page editorial paper, 19 pages editorial paper, and then followed by 43 additional papers just on the p-value. And in it, the, the ASA says this is a significant day in the history, or, or the announcement of the special issue. It says this is a significant day in the history of the ASA and statistics. So again, it's a very exciting time, and it's it's a it's a it's a big it's a big deal, and we're just starting. The transition period is just starting, and I'm going to talk more about all this. So let's start with the statement. So this is the the 2016 statement, and it had basically. Just to give you a summary of what it was about, it gave six principles. And it started by saying, let's be clear, nothing in the ASA statement is new. So this is an accumulation of decades of, of things that were misinterpreted and, and published with the wrong interpretation. And the ASA said, okay, let's, let's once and for all, let's make things clear. So nothing new in that statement, but just sort of pushing it as, you know, scientific community, be aware of all these things. And the six principles were p-values can indicate how incompatible the data are with a specified statistical model. Two, p-values do not measure the probability that the studied hypothesis is true or the probability that the data were produced by random chance alone. That's what we talked earlier. Three, scientific conclusions and business or policy decisions should not be based only on whether a p-value passes a specific threshold. Four, proper inference requires full reporting and transparency. Five, a p-value or statistical significance does not measure the size of an effect or the importance of a result. You probably may have heard uh, you know, statistical significance versus clinical significance or clinical importance. Different concepts, not to be mixed. And six, by itself, a p-value does not provide a good measure of evidence regarding a model or hypothesis. And it says no single index should substitute for scientific reasoning. Just one number. We can't have just one number and then let's say we, that's the conclusion, just on based on one number. We have to have also scientific reasoning behind it. And we're going to talk more about this in this segment. Now, so that was the statement in 2016. Let's talk about the special issue in March 2019. It says moving to a world beyond P less than 0.05. So what is this about? Well, the special issue, sort of, again, a summary. It says, don't base your conclusions solely on whether an association or effect was found to be statistically significant, i.e., p-value passed some arbitrary threshold such as p less than 0.05. Don't do that. Don't believe that an association or effect exists just because it was statistically significant. Don't believe that an association or effect is absent just because it was not statistically significant. Don't believe that your p-value gives the probability that chance alone produced the observed association or effect or the probability that your test hypothesis is true. A lot of don'ts. Don't conclude anything about scientific or practical importance based on statistical significance or lack thereof. And it says in that special issue, we, we, we know it's a lot of don'ts. Uh, this time, we're not just going to give you, these are the editorial, the, the authors of the editorial. They're saying, okay, this time, we're not just going to give you don'ts, but we're also going to give you some do's. And they do. They do in those uh, uh, 43 additional papers. So what's the bottom line of this special issue? The bottom line is 
the term statistically significant, statistically different, P less than 0.05, non-significant, there is an effect, there is no effect, and any similar expressions should not be used at all, whether expressed in words, by asterisks in a table, or any other way. It's very categorical about it. Just don't do it. P-values can be used. Now, that's, that's what I particularly like about the uh, special issue and that uh, editorial and is that they're not saying, let's completely ban p-values. No, they're saying they can be used, but when they are used, they should be reported as a continuous quantity. So give the value of the p-value, not a threshold, not yes, no, based on a threshold. They should not be dichotomized, it's same thing. You should not have a threshold and say yes, less or greater than. Give the value. And think of p-values as measuring compatibility between hypotheses and data, and interpret internal estimates at, as compatibility intervals. Um, you know, again, it, it's, it's, it's a transition. It, it's easy to say, but it's really hard because we have to change the whole thinking and, you know, even though you know, I am aware of this special issue, I read the editorial, and I'm very much supportive of it, very much so. Um, it is hard. It's a hard thing. It's going to take time, uh, and it's going to take effort, and, it, and it's, we have to get used to it. Uh, but we have to move in that direction. I forgot to say that also with, the, uh, the, the, with this editorial, in March, there was also a, a special uh, paper in uh, Nature, also in March 2019, uh, in Nature magazine, and there was a national public radio piece also in, in March 20th, on March 20th, 2019, about this, this editorial. So you may think, oh, well, I'm, I'm kind of <clears throat> maybe exaggerating what the ESA is saying. You know, may, maybe they're not that strong about it. Maybe they're just saying, well, we recommend or we would prefer. Well, just to be clear, let me show you this. This is in the editorial, section two. The title says, the title, don't say statistically significant. I mean, you can't be more direct as this. It says the ASA statement on p-values and statistical significance, that's the 2016, stopped short, just short of recommending that declarations of statistical significance be abandoned. We just didn't do that in 2016. But guess what? We are doing it now. Just don't say statistically significant. Let's stop that. So, they summarize in the editorial, there's kind of a summary of all this and moving to a world beyond P less than 0.05. And, and they're, they're all good, good points here. And I think it's, it's important for the scientific community to, to train ourselves to think that way, accept uncertainty. You know, you do an experiment, you find a result. Well, all this is uncertain. It's not definitive it still has uncertainty. Just because the data shows something, it doesn't mean that's it. In one shot, we discovered the truth. Just because we have a statistical model doesn't mean that we got rid of all uncertainty. Things are still uncertain. Accept uncertainty. Be thoughtful. Just don't rely on one number. You look at one number, that's it. We're done. That's the conclusion based on one number. No, what does it mean? Uh, is that does that make sense uh, scientifically? Uh, it, what's the uncertainty around it? Uh, just to be a little bit more thinking than just reacting to just one number. I mean, I like this this statement. It says a declaration of statistical significance is the antithesis of thoughtfulness, um, and, and and that's basically what it's about. Be open. Uh, basically, it's, it says, you know, just give, put, register your clinical trial. Put your raw data uh, unidentified out there. Uh, put your code of analysis out there. 
Uh, let people try to reproduce what you did. Uh, sort of let's, let's be open and let's share. And we're all going to benefit from it. Uh, but just more transparency. What did you do? Was this pre-specified? Um, so be open. Uh, be modest. <laughs> Again, it, it just accept that what, what we find with one experiment is not, that's it. We found the cure. We found this. No, there is still uncertainty. We still have to confirm it. We still have to reproduce it. So uh, modesty. Um, <clears throat> and institutional change is needed. And that's basically is huge because then basically what it says is journals have to change their thinking. Uh, Investigators have to change their thinking. Statisticians have to change their thinking. Uh, education, the way we teach statistics, have to change. Uh, universities' incentives, university incentives to publish what's significant has to change. Lots of things have to change. Again, it's not going to be easy. It's not going to be quick. But we really have to, to move uh, in, in that sense. And like I said, I mean, uh, you know, I, I'm, I'm still reviewing manuscript where I am a co-author and uh, I say, OK, I'm, I'm going to I'm going to start the new thinking. I'm going to get rid of anything that says statistically significant. Well, it's easy, easier said than done. And then I say, OK, what do we say instead? And uh, and it's not, it's not obvious. Uh, so so it, it is going to take some effort. And the ASA puts the, these in as a as a acronym, atomic for accept uncertainty, thoughtful, open, modest, and institutional change. So, what is the connection between p value and sample size? I want to talk about that. Uh, <clears throat> so you have a randomized control trial you know, comparing two treatments: the folic acid plus vitamin B6 versus placebo. Your primary outcome measure is systolic blood pressure and you get the results from 130 clinically healthy individuals and the difference uh, between the two treatment arms between the two treatments the reduction in uh, systolic blood pressure is 3.7 millimeters of mercury okay and the confidence interval is from 0.6 to 6.8 millimeters, and the two-sided p-value is 0.02. All right, and that's published uh, in that article, in that reference. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna show you something. So we're gonna talk about the distribution of the difference between the two treatment groups when in fact there is no difference. So the difference is zero, is centered at zero. This is the distribution of the difference. So we said the observed difference is 3.7 millimeter and the standard deviation, so the variability of the data is 17.96 millimeters of mercury. That's, that's the result, these are the results from the clinical trial. And we also said that the sample size was 130, and this was the confidence interval, and the two-sided p-value is 0 0.02. Again, two-sided p-value, it means the probability of getting a result, what we did, 3.7 or more extreme on both sides, as the one we got under the assumption of no difference, that's 0 0.02. Okay, so why am I doing all this? Well, what I'm going to do next is I'm going to keep pretty much everything the same except for the sample size. We're trying to answer what's the co connection between p-value and sample size. So, the observed difference is the same. The standard deviation is the same. But now my sample size is 40. Now, we, you may say, you may think, wait a second, if the standard deviation is the same, how come this is flatter than the other distribution with 130? Because this distribution is based on standard error, whereas I'm keeping the standard deviation constant. The standard error is the standard deviation divided by square root of n. So as n goes down, the standard error uh, goes up. In that case, the confidence interval goes from minus 1.9 to 9.3, and the two-sided p-value is 0.21. 
All I've changed is the sample size. I didn't change the results, the observed difference, and the spread of the data, the variability of the data. Didn't change that. All I changed is the sample size. Different results. Now let's go the other, the other way. Let's say the sample size is 250 instead of 130. The distribution of the difference is much more narrower. The confidence interval goes from 1.5 to 5.9, and the p-value is 0 0.0013. Again, the data has now changed. Same mean difference, same standard deviation, same spread, just the sample size. So what is the connection between p-value and sample size? If you keep everything the same, but you increase the sample size, the p-value is going to go down. So, there are two ways to get small p-values, guaranteed, sounding like a commercial. You know, if you want a small p-value, I guarantee you, there are two ways you can get a small p-value. You just increase your sample size, analyze a very large sample, you're going to get a small p-value, guaranteed. The second way, I'll tell you later, but that's one way. So, p-value and power. By definition, and this is another misinterpretation, another thing that I, I you know, it is quite often is, is, is done incorrectly. By definition, we cannot calculate p-value at the design stage, by definition. Why by definition? Because p-value is getting the probability of getting results as extreme or more extreme than the one we got. So we can't do that at the design stage, which we don't have results. So the p-value is meaningful only after results are known. By the same token, power is meaningful only before results are known. And po post hoc power is meaningless. Calculating power after the experiment based on the data is meaningless. What is the connection between alpha and p-value? If the p-value is less than alpha, typically 0.05, the null hypothesis of no difference is rejected, and the result is declared statistically significant at the 5% alpha level. I know what you're thinking. If the p-value is greater than alpha, the result is not statistically significant at the 5% alpha level. Ah, I'm saying statistically significant. That's the old thinking. Now, it's correct. These statements are correct. They've been used the way they've been used, so it's, it's, that doesn't make them wrong or, you know, we've been doing the wrong thing all this time. But this is, we're trying to move away from this kind of thinking. The problem is that sample size and minimum clinically important difference are ignored when we talk about just p-value. So the new thinking is not to reject the null hypothesis solely on the p-value. <clears throat> not to do that. And do not dichotomize your conclusion. Statistically significant, not statistically significant. There is an effect, there is no effect. Don't do that anymore. So here's, here's a paper. This is from the same special issue. And it, it, it's, it's a very, very good paper. Uh, it basically says use confidence interval along with p-values. Don't We're not banning p-values. We're saying along with p-values, use confidence interval. But even more than that, so let's say we talk about the example of systolic blood pressure and, you know, reduction is going to the right. So the right is a good thing. Uh, no difference is zero. And we say, okay, I found the confidence interval where the p-value is 0.09 and here's the confidence interval, covers zero. Uh, so not statistically significant. And the, the, the author of this paper is saying, no, no, just don't do just that. Don't rely just on the p-value. Look at something else for, because, you know, you're ignoring sample size. What if the sample size was bigger? Same difference, same difference, but the sample size is bigger. The confidence interval is going to be narrower. The p-value is going to go down. Now you have a p-value of 0.01. All you've changed is the sample size. So now it's statistically significant all of a sudden. Well, what if I told you that the minimum clinically important difference is four millimeters of mercury for the systolic blood pressure. So in other words, anything, any reduction less than four really is not that big a deal. 
Well, then in this case, that bottom confidence interval, is that really an interesting result? And the author claims, maybe not, even though p is 0.01. So that goes back to the thoughtfulness. The, 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 think more than just one number. <clears throat> now, again, just because of sample size, but let's say I, do a, I increase the sample size, but now I, I find a confidence interval that's completely above the minimum clinically important difference. The p-value is 0.001, but, but I'm not just relying on the 0.001, I'm also looking at the confidence interval and comparing it to the minimum clinically important difference. And now I can be confident that the reduction in systolic blood pressure is indeed more than four millimeters, or at least, again, we go back to accept uncertainty. It looks like, it seems like we can be pretty confident or the data is compatible with the hypothesis that it is, the reduction is more than four millimeters. See, it's very easy to, to fall in the trap of the old thinking. Here are the references for this uh, segment. So in summary, do not dichotomize p-values or statements related to p-values. When reporting results on differences, use p-values, the continuous value, point estimates, that's the dot in the confidence interval, confidence intervals, the lower and upper limit, along with the minimum clinically important difference. And that's where the thoughtfulness comes in. What is the minimum clinically important difference? It's not a statistical question. It is a clinical question. And so my questions to you are, what is the connection between p-value and alpha? And what is the connection between p-value and sample size? Thank you for watching.